must have met me over the course of the last few days. My name is Mel Figueroa, and I'm going to talk about decolonization today. I also want to say up front that I am not indigenous to this continent. My people are from the eastern Visayas Islands of what are now called the Philippines. Uh, our pre-colonial name was Tendaya. Our post-colonial name, the name that we are given in all of the ethnic registries, is what I. It's a term that means nothing. So our tribe is literally nothing. <laughs> but but because and but because of the work that I'm doing, the decolonization work that I'm doing in occupied Machuca territory, which is now called Chico, California, um, that's also a process of discovering my roots and discovering what it means to be, you know, somebody who is indigenous to somewhere, being in a place and helping with decolonization in the place where I live. Okay, so a lot of this is coming from a positionality of myself, being a, a non-indigenous person of color from somewhere else, but learning how to be a good guest in the place where I live. Okay. First thing you gotta know is where you are, all of you, wherever you're at, whatever ground you walk on, first responsibility is to learn where you are. And when you learn where you are, you understand that the land tells stories. So where we are in California, and I'm mostly going to be talking about California, because that's where we do our work. There are many territories all over Turtle Island that I don't know about. So I'm not going to speak to that. I might say some general stuff. But um, mostly, I'm going to talk about our context. So this place that is called California was home to a great variety and diversity of indigenous peoples. Um, if you see the territories, you know, there are some larger ones, but there are some smaller ones that might be no more than 30 square miles. But to see that it was, there were dense, large populations that were supported by territories that were less than 30 square miles says something about the abundance, the abundance that was stewarded and created on that land. As Canyon Sayers Roots, who is part of the Amalitsan Band of all the Indians in, in, in California, saying, when the colonizers arrived in California, they saw a lush bounty of nature. They failed to see that this abundance was because of the respectful stewardship of indigenous peoples over thousands of years. California is the number one economy in the United States, the fifth largest economy in the world, and the third largest agricultural economy of the world. All of that is based on thousands of years of stewardship, right? And, and you know, people want to tell you, Ishii is the last wild in California, you know? But that's simply not true. Indigenous peoples are still trying by hell or high water you know, low key, underground, <laughs> hidden, not hidden, to continue their stewardship of these places. In terms of the colonization of the continent, California's colonization is relatively recent. It's only 180 years since, Cal since white first contact in many parts of California. Um, and so those, um, these traditions of what has been called tending the wild, or wild tending, which is funny because there's no such word as wild in most indigenous languages, um, but it is tending the landscape for things like basket materials, right? Um, uh, for things like medicinal products. And of course in California, which is fire's home, traditional fire and tending of the landscape through <coughs> cultural fire is something that is absolutely essential has been missing from the landscape for over a century. And because of the big wildfires now, now finally people are trying to recognize, oh, maybe fire, you know, you, you can have a little fire, you get a big fire, but you can't never have no fire in California. All of this forms a complex that has been called and is a term that is being mobilized by tribes um, is a, a complex called traditional ecological knowledge. Now don't let the word traditional fool you. This is not in the past, right? Rather, it is a method and a science 
that is applicable, as applicable, if not more so today than it has been, right? Yeah. So what is the science of TEK? It's based on community-based natural resource management, right? We have to say these fancy terms today, but it's just life. Yeah. It's a way of life, right? And, um, and it's a place-based way of life, right? I cannot come here to Vermont and be like, hey, culture fire and all this stuff. No, it's uh, not even, it's not the right biome, it's not the right, and it's not my place to say, you know, what is in a place that is not the one that I'm working in, right? Um, in a place-based, uh, in, in, in particular places, particular peoples have co-evolved with the species of a place, right? We use the term cultural keystone species um, in both political and scientific ways to show that the keystone species of an ecosystem, right, whether it's salmon, whether it's willow, whether it's, um, you know, oak trees, um, those keystone species are keystones of the ecosystem because they have been culturally significant to the people of that place for food, for medicine, for cordage, for building materials, for whatever. And so when we understand that ecosystems and people are intertwined, when we understand that ecosystems and people are intertwined in particular ways of life, we have to understand that when we live in a place, there are rules, right? We have to understand the rules of the place that we live. Everyone, right? From people who are gardening in the front yards to people who are making decisions about land management to planners to to everybody needs to understand that there are that there's a there's a key, there's basic e ecosystem and social dynamic that is unique to a place, right? And the thing about it is that it's not something you can read in a book. It's not something you can do in a manual. You have to do it to know it. I can't, you know, it sounds real woo, but it's not woo, it's science. It is yeah. that, that yeah. method of having a relationship with the molecules and the ground and the soil and the plants that sustain you, right? It is understanding that you're having this molecular and quantum exchange, right? And you don't know it unless you do it, right? You have to, you have to make a uh, form a relationship with the plants and the soil and the water to un really understand what that means. I'm going to speed through a bunch of these slides because I don't have enough time, so there's text on it, so um, if you want to know more about the text, come see me, you know, like give me a blend and I'll rant to you for hours about this. No, <laughs> That area is for the Wintu. That area is for the Machuta. That area is for um, 
the Kharuk. It's like they, they knew that there were visitors coming through those places, and they would set aside land for those people yeah. to cultivate the plants that they knew, right? Because, because there was this relationship and agreement between different peoples. There was large-scale land management when people were like, well, did you just kind of like manage the area around your house, like the yard or something? No, right? As, as Alexander Knight, the practitioner that I worked with, said to Congress, we tended everywhere because everywhere was home. And those large field management included fire, included raised fields, included um, anthropogenic mounds, right? Like three sisters and all of this stuff. It was a whole plethora of ways that the environment worked with peoples. And there was seasonal migration. It's it property doesn't fucking make sense. When you're managing it, you know, it's, okay? in the woods, it's not going to make any sense. It make, doesn't make me safe, it doesn't make anybody else safe. So you seasonally migrate it um, to follow the, the cycles, right? Um, again, tribal territories and trade routes are based on watershed boundaries, right? So having intact watersheds is really important. There are even pre-colonial Pacific trade routes. My people are connected to the people of California. Yes, we are. That's being proven by DNA, and it's proven by our stories, and it's proven by the wind currents and looking at climate um, dynamics across the Pacific. Now, when we look at climate change in California, everybody knows the wildfires. Everybody knows the high temperature. Everybody knows the drought. What they don't know about is the flood. And that's what we're preparing for in California, is the great flood that comes every 200 years. Of course, California is only 180 years old, so you don't even know about a 200-year flood if you're in California because you don't know it, right? But the indigenous people know it. The Hawaiians knew it. The last big flood was in 1862. Guess what? There's all of these wonderful these articles that were like, the natives mysteriously disappeared before the flood came. Like, no, wait, they went to high ground. <laughs> Right? Um, in 2017, when the Oracle Dam was about to break, and all of these people were going into the flood area oh, God. because that's where the major highways were to evacuate, right? And then we had this elder from Berry Creek going, where the hell are you going? Go up! <laughs> You're all going to die! Go up! You know? Um, but this is what we're preparing for. This is tied to El Nino, right? Um, and the, all the flooding that we've seen in Australia and China and the others, like, like that's a La Nina year. So it's dry here, floods over there. When it comes back, right, that's what we're anticipating, seven to 10 years until the third largest economy, the agricultural economy in the United States gets taken out by a flood. All the dams are gonna get taken out. That huge state water system all of, you know, Stuart and Linda Resnick, you want water, you will get water. You're going to get all the water. <laughs> so that's what we're preparing for. We're preparing for this ethical flood. And in climate change, it's only going to come faster and harder. Right? So those are the, the future things that we are, you know, now collaborating with TEK practitioners, with Hawaiians, with other folks to un understand what this means and what, how we can prepare. And, you know, um, again, when you're connected to the land, you understand that to survive disasters, you need everybody. You need not just to hoard your guns and your canned food, but what you need is to plant the hillsides with food, to plant wherever you can with medicines, to save your seeds and expand your seed base, you know? All of the things that we need to survive, we need to put there in advance, you know? That's something that I recognize from my people. My dad went through World War II, and he would always talk about the old women in the forest that would plant the hillsides with potatoes so that the people who were uh, fleeing the occupation and going through the forest could have something to eat, you know? so. So, you know, this is something I recognize from my culture and my people, 
and what I'm helping, you know, the, the, the in California prepare for. But we don't know this. A lot of us don't understand this. A lot of us have been very separated from this molecular exchange, right, between plants, animals, water, soil, and, and ourselves. And, you know, in Marxists call this primitive accumulation. But what we can think about it is as a separation, right? If I am a person indigenous to a place, and it's my job as a human to be, take care of that place, I can look at you and say, you are human. You have, you come from a place. You take care of your place. I get you. In La Edge, I see you, right? So what, how do we, how do we, how, how, how does colonialism make the perfect colonial army? By separating. Right? They did it to themselves first so that they could create a force that would not see the God in you, that would not see the God in you. It makes it easier to kill them and take over land. Right? So primitive accumulation cuts through right, this indigenous relationship that every person on earth had with their place on earth to separate it from the land and to separate it from these ways of being that allowed us you see the God in each of us. And that's how colonialism is made possible. Some of you have been separated longer than others, right? But we've all had that connection, and we're all in the process of healing the severing of that connection that took place at different places, times in history. All right, uh, how much time I got? Anyone? Right. Because when we look at our landscapes today, we all have to understand that our landscapes are not, and then we think about what is this land capable of, we have to understand that we are in an, a post-apocalyptic environment, yeah. right? In California, the apocalypse already happened 180 years ago. In other places, on the, in the Great Plains, all of this. And so to understand the changes that happen in the earth should um, give us the urgency and the tools to try to imagine what it means to put it back, right? So there's three things that happen in colonialism and three ways that it changes the land. Number one, you take away the food sources, right, of the people of that land and you log it, right? Then you eliminate the traditional medicines and the ways of life, meaning the riparian areas, the watershed areas, right? The freeways and the roads that connected uh, peoples together. And then you transform the land, you capture the water, right? You divert it with dams and other things and, and industrial, uh, the industrial land, and then you put in monoculture. Well, you, what would I mean, colonizers, right? <laughs> colonizers put in monocultures, farms, cows, right? So all of these things that people think are natural are not really natural. They are the product. Oh, and then maybe there's a little nature preserve over here. Mm -hmm. Like, let's take like the two plants that remain, put them in the preserve, okay? But when you understand the profound transformation that has taken place, when you understand this is a simulated satellite image of California in 1851 with the wetlands that sequestered 1,200 kilotons of, of carbon in a time when we are like fighting over single tons of carbon for sequestration. These wetlands were one of the largest carbon sinks that we could have. That's gone. Those mounds, those village mounds, those wetlands and those marshes have been paved over, right? And now produce almonds and pomegranates and weird shit that you get in the supermarket, right? When you think about the, the, the overlapping territories and the trade routes and the shared areas that indigenous people had long-standing relationships with and understand that these get paved over with boundaries and national parks 
and national forests. But remember, that's all federal land, and federal government has a trust responsibility to tribes. There is an opening. There's also other geographies that map over some of these. The geography of freedom and of resistance and of escape, right? So the Africans who were kidnapped from their continent and brought over here, you remember, you, I mean, the, the Africans remember because they had, they were not separated from their relationship. So they got into this continent and went, I see you. You take care of your land, I take care I took care of my land. How do we take care of it here? You know? And African religions in the diaspora incorporated indigenous spirits and incorporated indigenous practices and dance together to have the option to escape. Those are geographies we need to understand as well. Right? So what does land back mean? It's a social return of traditional life ways and social relation, that's social production, or, or social reproduction. It is eco-social reproduction of particular places, meaning you have to talk to the particular people of a specific place and think about you know, those, how those uh, relations get reproduced. And it is political. It is about recognizing tribal governance. And yet, tribal governance exists everywhere, federally recognized or not. But it's up to us as a, a non-native community to recognize that. And it's also recognizing that it's not necessarily about ownership. Ownership is a colonial term, right? Um, you know, colonization makes you believe ownership is physical, not a spiritual and historical responsibility to put the land back. Yeah. Woo, the way it should be. Yeah. And that's a responsibility of all of us, with tribes and tribal people and traditional practitioners in the lead. They have to lead us, right? Or, or we let them lead us. Or, you know, there's all kinds of self-determination decisions and relations of respect and trust that, you know, are long-term, that we have to cultivate very carefully and respectfully with indigenous people. But when they say move, we gotta move, right? So some, colonizing is behavior, not a race or trait, right? So you're a colonizer, you are behaving in a colonizing manner. And there are people in our movement that behave in colonizing manner. So we have to examine ourselves as well, right? Decolonizing is an action, not a statement. When you understand you have to put the land back, you have to put it back. It's not just a land acknowledgement. Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. You said that, you know, land acknowledgement without action is a, kind of sounds like a victory lap. Yeah, yeah. Right? You have to engage in the physical process and the eco-social process of decolonization. And that takes many forms. There are as many forms of this as there are indigenous communities, right? Um, there's formal, formal sovereignty, but that gets complicated, right? Um, but sovereignty is the act thereof, right? Where there are legal rights, they, are, they need to be tested in practice, and tribes are moving, tribes are doing this all over Turtle Island. But that those legal rights and moral rights and social rights to governments must be backed up, supported, and enforced by the wider non-tribal community, right? And, that, and that's, that can get complicated. But again, it's about us really cultivating those deep relationships of respect, and respectfully doing so, and of trust to understand what the, what the true path is in a specific place. So in sum, put the land back. Okay, and you gotta listen. You know, when in doubt, shut up and listen. Mm. Learn and do.
Word. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, it's really great to follow you and scare you, too. Uh, I'm afraid I'll be changing the taste because I'm not <laughs> like, like you are. <laughs> I'm an Oki, I'm a soft, uh, slow speaker, so um, I hope I don't put you to sleep after, after this. Uh, but it's awesome what you uh, said, and, and uh, indigenous knowledge is thousands of years. And we pass it on through song and dance. And uh, um, people who are really into learning memorization, I uh, will tell you that songs are the best way to learn things, even learning names, learning dates, uh, learning history, learn, learning anything. If you can make a song out of it, you can learn it and learn it forever. And so they, when the colonizers came across the water with their doctrine of discovery, what they saw was all of us wild heathens dancing and singing around the fire, singing our stories, singing our history, singing everything that we knew, our knowledge, teaching it to the children that way. And they were doing it too. And all they saw was a bunch of wild Indians, you know. They had everything written down in books. They were so smart. <laughs> they didn't have to remember it because it was in a book. Right. And now they've polluted the atmosphere to the point where they're destroying all life on Earth, including their next generations if they don't stop. That's how smart they are. <laughs> and now they're looking to us. <laughs> wow. <laughs> So, I want to tell you about how we kick ourselves out of this if we can. I'm Earl Hatley. I'm an enrolled member of the Mrs. Coy Band of the Abenaki Nation here in Vermont. I also have Cherokee and Shawnee heritage. Um, I uh, am president of a, a, a small uh, nonprofit organization in Oklahoma, uh, where I'm from. I lived most of my life in, in Oklahoma. Uh, the last 25 years of that on the Cherokee Reservation. Um, that's the culture that I grew up around. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Oklahoma is an oil and gas state, but also with mining. My talk is going to be about this uh, transition from oil and gas to uh, renewable energy, but how I see it is from one extracted technology to the next extracted technology as far as indigenous peoples are concerned because renewable energy is dependent upon mining for uh, strategic minerals. And 70 to 97 percent of those are found on indigenous lands. And so, uh, I think a lot of folks are wanting me to talk about my work in Oklahoma just for a little bit, and I want to show you the dichotomy between these two, and then show you a solution. So Cushing, Oklahoma, um, where I lived for a long time, about 24 years down near here, has the nation's largest oil storage or tank farms. And uh, so for uh, uh, several years, uh, we fought the Keystone XL pipeline. A lot of folks think or equate the Keystone XL pipeline as that coming down from the north. Um, and they saw that fight in Nebraska and the Dakotas. However, I spent my time fighting in, in Oklahoma, and because of the media blackout, most folks don't know about it. They did uh, see that fight in Texas because the woodlands of Texas had much taller trees than we have in Oklahoma. And so they got to have tree sits in blocking the pipeline there. Our trees weren't tall enough. <laughs> 
And so we blocked it in a much different way. We set up tri tripods in front of the trench and put a person on top of the tripod. And then we blocked ourselves to the equipment and then forced the shutdown for a day while they tried to unravel all that with their fire trucks and everything else. And uh, that was how we blockaded. So we created uh, Tarzan's uh, Great Plains Tarzan's Resistance was the Oklahoma group that I created. I uh, brought in uh, uh, Earth First and uh, uh, Rainforest Action to help train Okies to do this. And uh, we started from right there when they first started trenching right in Cushing all the way down to the Red River. This is uh, Cushing is in uh, north central Oklahoma. So every county, we were getting arrested all the way down, fighting the southern leg of the Keystone XL pipeline, which Barack Obama blessed and fast-tracked the uh, uh, permit from Cushing all the way to the Gulf of uh, Mexico, uh, Port Arthur. He came to Cushing, <coughs> stood here, and said, I will fast track the southern leg of Keystone Excel so that you can send Tarzans to the Gulf. What had happened was in 2010, before people started fighting the Keystone Excel, after he had signed the permit for the um, Alberta Clipper to bring Tarzans down from Alberta to uh, uh, Peoria, Illinois. That pipeline was built. TransCanada then linked it from Steel City to Cushing and started stacking Tarzans in some of these uh, tanks. So then people, then they came out with their permit request for their own pipeline, which was the keystone that we all know and hate. So people started fighting that. While they were fighting that, TransCanada was shipping tar sands down that Alberta Clipper and then down what they call the Keystone One to Cushing. So they were already sending tar sands to Cushing while people were fighting Keystone XL. And then he blessed off on the southern leg and they started digging that. I created another organization uh, Clean Energy Future Oklahoma and took um, the Army Corps of Engineers in the federal court over nationwide permit 12, twice, and into appellate court twice. Guess who was the uh, head judge in the appellate court? Gorsuch. <laughs> so I was up against Gorsuch, Gorsuch twice and uh, he ruled against us. So the rest is history. In 2012, tar sands started flowing from Cushing to Port Arthur. <laughs> this was part of our resistance. This is the camp family of Ponca Nation. And uh, this was, as we were gathering to go out, uh, to blockade the dig, they did a ceremony for us. I uh, pull up this picture because on the right is Carter Camp, a very famous uh, uh, pain, uh, activist leader who passed away just shortly after we took this picture. As we were uh, just as I was finishing up the second uh, court battle with Gorsuch, the uh, fracking industry has started creating so many earthquakes in Oklahoma that I had to start gearing up for that and creating another organization, statewide organization, to fight fracking. And I started organizing county organizations to fight fracking in each county where the earthquakes were the worst. <clears throat> My county had a time where 
we own property was the worst of the counties. And uh, so we created, uh, and that was Payne County. So we created stop uh, fracking Payne County, Oklahoma. <coughs> and so the earthquakes got really bad. Uh, there was one year where we had uh, 145 earthquakes of 3.0 and greater. Some of those were in the five point range. Um, that is its uh, peak. Uh, the average prior to fracking was uh, two three-pointers between 1978 and 2008. So you can see what the industry had done. <clears throat> the earthquakes demolished uh, our home on our land up there. <clears throat> Excuse me, caused twenty thousand dollars worth of damage to my property, my partner's house, and uh, so many people in our organizations uh, had uh, home damage, more than fifty percent of their homes. Insurance would not fix it, um, even if they had um, earthquake insurance, they wouldn't cover fracking earthquakes. Because you had to prove, okay, which well caused the damage, which earthquake from that well caused the damage. Well, you can't prove it. So you couldn't go to court and prove that well on such and such day caused this damage. You couldn't prove that. Because there were, the state of Oklahoma for years refused to acknowledge that fracking or disposal wells were the cause of earthquakes. So you, you couldn't prove that. They finally, in 2013, 2014, admitted that disposal wells caused earthquakes, but not fracking wells. Well, we all know that fracking wells cause earthquakes too. I felt them. Um, but that's what we were dealing with. So this is my You Can't Shoot Holes in the Truth poster that I put up on social media and it got into the newspapers uh, at the time. Um, just trying to blow holes in their uh, story about earthquakes. They were still in denial at the time. So that's a little gas. <laughs> that's our fossil fuels fiasco. Whether it's oil or gas, fracking is wrong. Now we're getting groundwater and surface water contamination from the fracking. They finally figured out how to slow down the earthquake problem, but we're still waiting for the big ones because the big ones are predicted. They activated all the faults in Oklahoma, and now they're all becoming really active. So they don't have to crack anymore. They can stop. And we're still going to face some really major earthquakes. So um, where, I, <clears throat> where I've been for the past 27 years is in the northeast corner of Oklahoma, working on solving the mining problem up there. <clears throat> in that circle, uh, Oklahoma, Missouri, Kansas, that circle is 2,500 square miles of abandoned lead and zinc mines. And uh, the mine companies, it all started in uh, 1887 after the allotment of uh, the tribes there. Uh, the federal government uh, or the Congress passed a law allowing for the leasing of mine in the uh, Papa um, agency there for all the tribes. And so the mining companies, miners moved down and they started mining. And, uh, and then in, uh, in the 60s, they abandoned the mines, stopped the pumping because the strata that they were mining in was the aquifer. So they had to continuously pump in order to be down there. And when they pulled the pumps, Within 10 years, in 1979, 
the mindset, all two of us, they were all interconnected uh, in the Oklahoma portion and uh, the mine water surface. And so we ended up with acid mine water flowing down Tar Creek into the Neosho River, killed all of the fish. That was in 79, fish are still dead. Um, and uh, we have a million and a half gallons of mine water flowing down Tar Creek every day. Um, the Amimas River spill in Colorado that everyone was concerned about 10 years ago out of the Gold King Mine, that entire spill was 3 million gallons. So every two days, Tar Creek gets 3 million gallons since 1979 to this very day. This is the map of the tribal jurisdiction in the Oklahoma portion of the Tri-State Mining District. The, uh, up in the Quahaw area, you see those uh, dots up near the Kansas border. That's the mining area. You can fly over it at 35,000 feet and see the tailings piles all over the surface. Um, so there's 10 tribes there. One of the tribes, the Shawnee tribe, broke away from the Cherokees. Uh, they don't have any land, so they're not depicted there. So there's nine tribes depicted here. Most of these are, well, uh, all except the Modoc or Eastern tribes. Most of these tribes are from the Northeast, actually. All of these tribes were relocated there. Um, my father's uh, heritage is Cherokee and Shawnee. They're, they're both located there. That's what it looks like uh, from the air. Just a piece of it is the uh, Oklahoma side is 47 square miles. It looks much like that. That's Tar Creek. It's orange. <laughs> all the way down to the Neosha River. You can see Spring River to the right coming down. Neosha River to the left where it says Miami coming down and where they meet that wind up starts the Grand River. Um, so my other organization is Waterkeeper Alliance. I was a Grand River Keeper for 18 years. I'm now on the uh, Waterkeeper Council, governing body of Waterkeeper Alliance. Uh, we're in 47 countries with 350 waterkeepers now. <laughs> so that's what it looks like on indigenous lands, mining. That's the legacy that we get left with when the mines play out and the mining companies leave. They very rarely clean up after themselves. If they do some kind of cleanup, it's not enough for us to practice our culture. In Oklahoma, every stream in Ottawa County, well, well first of all, that entire 2,500 square miles all drains into Oklahoma. The Missouri and Kansas part drains down at Spring River. And then the Tar Creek drains down Tar Creek into the Neosho River, and you see where they both meet. Where they come together is the headwaters of Grand Lake, which was dammed up by a hydro dam, backing the water up. The entire 2,500 square miles with all those tailing piles and mine water drains into that lake. That lake is our drinking water lake. We drink it. The fish are contaminated. There's a, a a, a fish consumption advisory for the fish in the lake. And all of the streams in Ottawa County, our entire county is a Superfund site. Mm -hmm. We have tested the plants in the repairing area and then the floodplains and they're all contaminated. So high that it's not safe to bring them home. So she was talking about gathering for making baskets. You can't do that. It's not safe to bring butt brush home to make baskets if you're gathering in the repairing and floodplain areas. The nuts, the wild strawberries, 
wild carrots. Um, the herbs are not safety at all. Okay, so 10 tribes cannot practice their culture. That's what's left behind, the legacy of mining. And so <clears throat> we're talking about the Biden and the Trudeau administration's rush to mine because such a low percentage of our energy right now is being generated by wind and solar. And we have a problem with battery storage. If we're going to make this transition, reducing by 45 or 50 percent, the IPCC is saying we need to reduce by 50 percent by 2030. Okay? We have a long way to go to get there. If we're going to do that, we need to really ramp up wind and solar and especially battery storage to get there. Can we even do that is the question. They're saying if we're going to get there, we need to really mine, and that's the direction that they want to go, is building all of these mines for lithium, cobalt, et cetera, to get us to that point. So uh, is that the right strategy? My question is, given how long it takes to find the ore, develop the site, and then go for a permit, get the permit, dig it up, process it, get it to the mill, get it processed at the mill, get it to the manufacturer. How long does that take? It takes roughly about a minimum of 10 up to 15 years. Okay, you're talking about 2035? Just to get it into the system. We will blow past 1.5C by that time, right? So, the other thing is I, I went online and I, to Wall Street and I saw a write-up by the mining industry. They said, they did the calculation, mining, just mining, produces 10% of our greenhouse gases. And they did, they did a run through about, that does not include transportation, does not include milling and processing the ore. They calculated that when you add all that up, it comes up to 26%. And okay, so we need to calculate the carbon footprint of everything that we do. That all needs to be added into our calculation. We need to know what we're doing. You know, we need to see what we're doing. So, you know, the question is, can we mine our way out of climate change? You know, that's what we need to be asking ourselves. In addition to people, I, I am co-chair of the Western Mining Action Network. It's an organization, a network, of over 400 organizations that are impacted by hard rock mining. Half of us are indigenous groups and tribes. I, and, and we have broken out into an indigenous caucus. I'm chair of the indigenous caucus. And we have met face-to-face uh, -face and, and, and developed a, a, a declaration. And we are opposed to new mines. We are opposed to mining. And we have built a campaign for the right to say no. We do not have the right to say no to mining on our lands. There's this uh, UN Declaration on the Indigenous Rights. In that declaration is free prior to informed consent. Canada and the U.S. have bought into the declaration. They've signed it. But how it's practiced is they'll call our tribal governments and they'll say, 
we're going to mine on your land. And we just called up to, uh, you know, well, you know, free prior. Consent means yes. Who owns the land? It's held in trust by the government. The government owns it. They're saying, we're going to mine. We're going to drill. So, yeah, you can buy it. Just go spend the money, get all your lawyers out there and have at it. And every now and then the tribe will win for a time until they come back. And then you have to do it again. And then they'll come back and you have to do it again. It never ends. You know, look at Anwar on the North Slope for drilling there. Look at Pebble Mine. They just won't stop. They just keep coming back. Because <clears throat> it's not our land. The doctrine of discovery. The Pope is in Canada right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I took off this Pope hat and put on that headdress that the decree gave him. It's just infuriates me. Some of our people with Debbie Man, Western Mining Action Network, took him around up there in northern uh, Quebec. I worked with them. We set the Pope up to ask him to rescind the doctrine of discovery. That doctrine is yeah. what gave the colonizers the right to look at us as heathens and to plant their flag and say we're king and, and God, the Pope, this is ours. And then the revolution came and they kicked them out and they became the colonizers. Yeah. All of it is built on the doctrine of discovery. Rescind the doctrine of discovery and what? You disempower the government as the owner. Think about that. <clears throat> so these uh, governments are being forced by the mining companies to see nothing but gold, whether they're mining for copper, lithium, whatever. They just see the right to dig. And so they're wanting to go for it. So I want to offer the alternative. What can we do about this? There is a way. And so with our campaign on the right to say no, which is a negative, and then people go, well, that's a negative, that's a negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To you, it's a negative to us. It's a real positive, because how much land do we have left after the you know, drive of discovery for the colonizers? caging everybody up on marginal lands that they thought nobody would want, now they want that. This is the 21st century invasion, you know? So yeah, there's a positive no. What part of no do you not get? <laughs> However, we also are putting out there, okay, <clears throat> mining is not going to get you out of climate change, not in time. So here's a caveat for you. Conservation, mass transit, reduced by 50% in 10 years through conservation. And so what does conservation mean? Not just energy efficiency, but energy use reduction. Stop using so much stuff. You know, it's the upper middle class and the, and the rich that are wasting it. I mean, look at the Navajo Res. People putting big water tanks on their pickups, driving 25 miles to get water, going back to their unelectrified homes, passing the mines as they go. They don't get any of it. You know, that's the sacrifice for the rich with their yachts and all of their homes and their office buildings all lit up 24-7 wasting all of that energy that the indigenous peoples are sacrificing for them. Use less, conserve. We need to straighten this out and make it just. So they, 
look at how much was, was saved just one year, 2020, because of COVID. Think about reducing 50% in 10 years. Can that be done? Yeah, I think it could. So we passed that um, um, infrastructure bill. There was money earmarked in the infrastructure bill for conservation and mass transit. In the uh, Defense Production Act that, that uh, uh, Biden pushed through, it earmarked billions of dollars uh, for subsidies for the mining. How stupid. Um, welfare for the rich. Welfare for the corporations once again. Take that money and add it to the uh, conservation and mass transit and that other bill. Pile that money up and make it available for local communities as grants that state and local organizations can use for energy efficiency and conservation so that we can, from the ground up, we can get this conservation effort going. You know, make that money available to us so we can make all the homes efficient and get everybody off the heating oil and, and, and on to, uh, um, you know, heat pumps in our homes and electrify the homes. You know, let's do all of this. Mass transit for real and in, in the urban areas as well. So let's do all this and reduce by 50% in 10 years. In the 10 to 15 years it takes to build mines, we can reduce by 50% at the same time and meet our Paris goals, meet the IPCC goals before they even get the mines built. So while they're doing that, the other thing that we can be doing, like they're beginning to do in Europe, they're passing a bill there for a circular economy. They determined in, in, in their uh, uh, research that a, a uh, recycling and remanufacturing industry, they could build that up by 2035, 2040. They could um, save 25 to 50 percent of the metals through recycling and remanufacturing, reducing the need that much for more mines. So if we were reducing by 50 percent and at the same time building a recycling industry and remanufacturing industry in this country, in 15 years we could be recycling and saving at the same time. If we get all that, how many mines would we really need? In addition, by within 15, 10 to 15 years, the research and development that's going on right now to figure out how to um, substitute in the technology for the, uh, the strategic metals that they're wanting to mine for, by that time we probably won't need much of those. So in 15 years, these mines might be obsolete already. Especially if we were doing this, conservation and building the recycling industry. So with the recycling industry, the problem with that is right now metals recycling is going to developing nations and it's really dirty industry there. Recycling needs to be local. It needs to be regulated and clean. It needs to be done right. And these jobs can be where the petroleum and mining are no longer taking place. So those jobs can go to, to uh, clean, uh, recycling, high-paying union jobs. So there's your just transition. Protect the natives, jobs for those that in the other industries, mining and, and uh, petroleum. So that's our solution. More just
challenges and contradictions of attempting to establish and expand tribal governance over indigenous territories in the context when actual tribal governments are legally creatures of the colonial state. And, um, and I'm, I'm thinking about how some of the most uh, impactful um, indigenous rebellions in more recent history in Canada and the United States, um, such as um, you know, Wounded Knee and uh, the occupation at Wounded Knee and the more recent uh, anti-fracking Mi'kmaq campaign in New Brunswick have been rebellions against their tribal governments in some way as um, kind of these implementers of um, you know, broader colonial designs. And uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts on how, how movements should relate and um, in possible ways through these problems. Thanks. Um, on the question about tribal governments, one of the things that um, we're working on in uh, the Western Mining Action Network and all the tribes uh, of the Indigenous Caucus that I chair have voted, like I said, to oppose mining, all mines, and the right to say no. One of the things that's happening is the 1872 um, mining law, which governs the mining right now, is up for reform. And there's pressure on us to support the reform of the existing mining laws. We have elected not to support that because that leads to new mining. Um, which we don't support. And the reason for that is because if we support the reform of that law, then they will, the mining companies and the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the United States and the equivalent in Canada will go to our elected leaders on the reservations and say, look, they supported this. We're going to operate under this new law. Everything is going to be clean. Everything is going to be fine. It will all be cleaned up when we're done. You have to support this. Like I said before, there's no right to say no. And they're going to say all of these groups supported this reform. This is going to be a reform process. Trust us. That's the conundrum that we're facing. If we support the new law, and we have tribes that are dealing with ongoing mine sites right now, and, and what they're facing is this new law would make them operate cleaner if we support the reform. And we have to support them in their struggle uh, for ongoing pollution from ongoing mining. And so we're faced with this kind of struggle because we do support our tribal peoples that are dealing with this, just like I'm dealing with the aftermath of the mining companies that came in, messed it all up, and walked away, and they won't send us the money that we need to clean it up. They won't support the EPA cleanup. They won't, you know, support that. They, they, they are non-cooperative, as they are all over the country. And, uh, you know, if push comes to shove and you take them into court, then they just declare Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They add a, something to their name and they move on and they continue on other indigenous land somewhere, Africa, wherever. So um, that law, they ended the Indian Wars with treaties in 1871. Then in 1872, they created this simple mining law which allowed anyone to come out and stake claim in the West 
as a way of populating the West. The Indian Wars are over. Come and get your land. And you can do it by staking a mining claim. And that's the law that we're operating under right now. So that's the difficulty of this whole thing. And so I'm organizing a conference right now, Western Mining Action Network Conference, at Thacker Pass for October. The, lit, the lar world's largest lithium mine, you know, impacting several native nations up there. They've already organized the standoff for their sacred site up there. And so what you're going to be seeing is if we can't get this conservation idea, if we can't get all of this going um, and stop the subsidizing for the mining, for the renewables, you're going to start seeing blockades and standoffs blocking these companies from getting to their mining sites. Say where that is? Nevada. In Nevada. And so uh, these are your alternatives. <laughs> You know, either see us blockading the roads to stop them from getting to the mines or let's start this conservation and build a movement that, to take us to a different direction. You know, not the mining, but conservation, use reduction, mass transit, and recycling of the metals that have already been mined instead of throwing them in the trash and, and hoarding them in basements all the use. Uh, computers and, and cell phones and everything else is just stacking up and not going anywhere so or out in the landfills or whatever. Let them mine the landfills. Okay, let's address those you know, two questions uh, then. Mine the center of the Pentagon, built, you know, build a mine there. <laughs> Because um, and it is it's so it's like heated, uh, the um the struggle inside here, but it is a worthwhile one. In the, because as Ali said, it's not just the whole the organization you know, is for the tribe, it's for the tribe's in unity and to adopt right. That said, there's also the need to legitimize um, the the status um, of tribal governments. In the land and, use, um, management because it's really you know a, a, for so long the dialect you know, of tribal relations has been just kind of pushed aside or, you know um, and so word when it comes to especially in our um, area things like, like the, the you know logging the organization is trying to adopt details into that said right like as you said Based on tribal governments um, are, for are relics of the centralized of the colonizing government, so they've been set up that way. way. You know, the boilerplate constitution to a out the of the BIA, you know, are not democratic that in the institution. Um, you know, um, and there's okay. and each okay. the community yeah. has yeah. you yeah. know yeah. Um, um, negotiated. So that would that be like like open more on conversation discussion. Do we understand what are many practitioners? Do we understand who are right, not the professional most tribal practitioners are not the government? How we some have been disabled or organizations and how to change it. Controversy around this moment. Um, in other places for various reasons. So when it comes to sort of movement supporting the efforts of practitioners. And to try to prevent then you might take a so much by the so land. Um, there are some important organizations to recognize that the elected and tribal if anyone is the necessary still uh, deal, but the necessary body for the government to government consultation. Then we go back and have between the state government. <laughs> um, so it's like um, what's holding you back from going? Um, those are official or, diplomatic. Um, what are some ways that you would want to see? Right. Some of that is necessary for public in order for you to get to right. four or five. Um, um, as as movement, but, again, the, the but it does. They don't. It doesn't control all, all the actions of a traditional practitioner. Um, because I mean, this, this is this is one thing, people one, based one, on one sort of is, but um, tactic that Ali has used as a traditional practitioner is to get one thing a resolution from her tribe that certifies her as a master's and practitioner, right? 
that gives her a, a level of and then money, like, like everybody has a knowledge that needs to be raised for a college degree, that gives a degree from a central piece. But that, the, what that does not do is give her the authority, the authority, authority to enter into government and to government and consultation. I so think, you know, simple on that. On that kind of words, but it's a worthwhile negotiation and struggle just to around correlation to establish these. You know, uh, you know, sorry, calls and false features within. And again, I do want to point out that with the primary um, within California, US, US um, um, there are also the um, you know associations of practitioners who can kind of serve really independently of as like vouching for each other, um, which has been very useful when it comes to um, you know agencies and other you know, private conservancies, other and movements who want to so that sort of um, like be advised by government. traditional practitioners that are not necessarily required government to government consultations. So you know the Forest Service you know has native practitioners that are employed by the Forest Service who can then inter you know interface directly with practitioners to think about you know best practices and hiring and all of that stuff. So it's a it's a delicate negotiation. Um, you know, sometimes it's t more tense than others when, when it does come to something that is um, that, that, that is a, a, a negotiation between Ali as a tribal member and practitioner and her government. It's not our place to intervene, you know. Sometimes we just have to sit back and pray and watch, you know, and hope that it gets resolved. And, you know, we've been able to move forward every single time. But you know, incorporating traditional ecological knowledge, restoration, workforce development for tribal members, um, it's kind of a new thing. So we're kind of like, you know, making the path as we walk. But there are times when we can be allied with individual practitioners and times when we have to step back and hope for the best because it's not our place to, to you know, um, uh, to intervene in what the community is doing. So again, it's that it's that it's in that process of of moving at the speed of trust and developing those relationships that you know that help along the way. Um, sometimes it's just we have to be present and you know principled and um, and and hold on. But you know, there's so many tribes now that are adopting and creating ways to put native hands back on native land to share knowledge and to and to help this and so the more that these um, these these processes become known and supported um, the, the more support that individual practitioners will have in putting forward their programs uh, we want to end it here and um, bring for lunch. A couple of things I just want to bring up from this conversation for us to add, folks who are doing some of the synthesis work. I thought I think I saw one. I think we need to have uh, include in there uh, another layer. We've we've talked about electoral politics, but kind of in a direct way, a practical way, but not in a direct way about what is the function of the state in the changing world that we live in. I think this question kind of got to that. And then I think we need to, to have some deeper conversations about how we define revolution. Um, what are the, the objectives of revolution and the practices to get there? So like Jamie and, and uh, Thaddeus, um, this, this one kind of side comment, um, but a central one. The, there were a lot more revolutions that happened in the 19th and 20th century than just the, 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 the Leninist oriented ones. Those are most written about because they had, they had governments to press their case for a long period of time that others did not for a lot of different reasons. Um, and different ways to get there were, were tried, some good, some bad. 
you're not going to find anything that worked the way they said it would, um, the way they hoped it would. Uh, there's going to be a lot of errors and mistakes, no matter what model of it, the Fabian socialist model in Tanzania or wherever else you want to look. You're going to find a lot of mistakes. You're going to find a lot of things that didn't, the theory didn't align with the practice. So I think we need to look at it. What are the objectives? And I'm saying that um, you spoke to it a little bit, Jamie, about like the time factor. If we define success as an accomplishing state power, then part of what you you described may be correct. But if if just holding state power and not actually engaging in social revolution, if that is not your objective then I, don't, I, I would question in the here and now if that was a revolution in the broadest sense of the word um, and where we need to go in terms of like degrowth, ecological change. Um, we can talk more about that, that later, you know, but um, trying to get us to, you know, part of this, I'll just say this, you know, we wanted to bring, I know I wanted to bring, speaking of this objective, people from different ideological tendencies together because we don't often do that. Right, particularly here in the United States, and to be in a space where we can dialogue, we can struggle, we can be honest about, you know, my tradition accomplished this, my tradition accomplished that, and let your tradition also fuck this up, your tradition also fuck this up, you know. So then we can be real with each other about, you know, what, what have we learned from the last two hundred years, you know, uh, or longer, you know, what have we really learned? Uh, and how do we improve our collective practice to, to do something better and different than what's been, been done before us to a degree. I'll stop much. Let's come back. Uh, tell everybody to come back. We need at least, I think, an hour and 30 minutes legitimate breaks. So that puts us at 3 o'clock, which is, it means a little bit behind schedule. We're being flexible with people needing a nap and sleep and eat. So tell everybody who's outside right now to come back at 3. Thank you, everybody.